By the way, Nate, congratulations on very, um, uh, how shall I say, brave photography. Oh, uh, thank you. Yeah, I thought you're going to say lucky getting my stolen gear recovered. But well, yeah, that, that's luck too. But uh, um, photographers, it's kind of your own fault for having everything in one place. <laughs> Just saying. Yeah. Um, yeah. But oh, yeah. like the poor guy that uh, is shooting all the endangered species, I, remember. I can't remember his oh. name. He had the same thing happen in an airport in Indonesia. And I don't know that they ever got his stuff back. No, species is lost forever, maybe, unless he redoes it. I, you know, I don't want to compare myself in this way, but all I could think at the time was, well, this isn't this isn't nearly as bad as Robert Kappa losing all his photos from D. Oh yeah. Yeah. Unbelievable. <laughs> There's nothing like that. So just a hillbilly coup, you know. <laughs> you got everything back, Nate? I did, except my Jolly Ranchers and my phone charger. And, and <laughs> well, you and know, my, and my marijuana pen and uh, forty dollars huh. lost forever. So made up pretty good. <laughs> yeah, a couple more people coming in, trying to get Paul mean, Bannon in. You mean these people that took your stuff know how to write and need a pen? Well, it's now it's for That's smoking. Oh, marijuana. Oh, oh, oh. So, but it, I didn't, they didn't include the, the marijuana. So they just <laughs> have the pen. So they have to figure out the rest. Oh. How many people were there that got caught? Uh, two, a boyfriend and a girlfriend. Um, I actually spoke to the lady on the phone the night before in arranging the, the sting. What, uh, you're trying to hit on her? <laughs> uh, well, she her name was Pretty. <laughs> that was her nickname, Pretty. Oh. And, uh, uh, you know, I liked them enough. I think they were just just people in a desperate situation. They lived in the projects and they um, saw an opportunity. Did you give them a signed I'm print? Not, I'm not convinced that the guy claimed, I'm not convinced I saw the surveillance footage of them stealing the, the backpack and I'm not sure it was the same guy. I'm not convinced sold that it was. And the guy, when they detained him, uh, he said that he works for the trash to, trash pickup and that he found it in the trash, which I, you know, whom I, you know, that's not out of, out of the question. And, and, uh, and so I just saw it as these people, you know, uh, had you know saw an opportunity for two thousand dollars and uh um that's a lot of money in in anyone's world let alone someone who's living in the projects and you know i, I wish they would have because they knew my identity they found it on my computer and they said they'd already kind of familiar with me i wish they'd have contacted me i would have gladly offered given them a reward hmm. um so but I didn't press charges or anything that wasn't that wasn't my goal or intention and uh and they got to go home that night and and uh at the same time the amtrak police said that um amtrak police said that you know if they're caught doing that again at union station they'll be in real trouble because basically the evidence was served on a silver platter we had everything they had everything they needed to press charges and convict and the guy had just gotten out on parole for grand larceny. Oh, perfect. A month ago. Perfect. So it would have been really, really bad. So. I can assume if they had used the cameras, they probably would have offered to give you photo credit. <laughs> well, and, and it helps that my camera, most people who have, when you see Leicas, use Leicas for sale, they're in pristine condition because everyone babies them. Mine is beat to shit. And so uh, it was unmistakably that's mine guys so i just basically when we messaged them and it was a hail mary said hey the, look this is mine um didn't, yeah. the, didn't the uh the monkey who took a self-portrait a couple years ago get credit for the photo yeah yeah no i don't i don't it didn't look like they took any <laughs> so it would have been funny but they used their i just couldn't believe all the mistakes they made if you're gonna you know, they claimed the camera was found and, and it, you know, and, and they were good people and praise be to God that 
<laughs> we found each other and and we everyone could end happy end up happy um just to but they used you know once they gave us their phone number we had all the info we needed and then when they agreed to meet at the scene of the crime <laughs> it's like oh my gosh really <laughs> cool because amtrak police don't have jurisdiction beyond that and that's where the police report was filed so just extremely extremely fortunate so did you I, have I, all of your equipment checked out and, and uh, worked yeah, on it? Yeah, everything works. My, I'm locked out of my computer because um, uh, they changed the password. Um, the, the password hint is now fat baby. And so I, I need to go to the Mac store and see about them breaking into my computer. That's another thing to crowdsource, set it out there. What does fat baby mean to you? <laughs> <laughs> As a password hint. Yeah. You only have 10 tries or something. <laughs> yeah. So Maybe you want anyway. to keep that name. What's that? Maybe, Welcome maybe everyone. You want to keep that name. Fat baby? Fat baby. Maybe they have more maybe they have more interesting friends than you do. <laughs> That's Domino. Did yeah, you right. try Fat Baby as the password? <clears throat> So welcome everyone. As you can tell, my guest today is Nate Gowdy. We've already been talking about uh, some of the things going on. Uh, so I'm just gonna turn it over to everyone to start asking questions because Nate has been traveling and photographing political campaigns, the Capitol riot, the inauguration, and has many stories to tell. Um, we we're already talking about his camera and computer and hard drives getting stolen and recovered. And that seems to be the one of the big stories, but I think Nate has a few others for us. So Nate. What do you want to talk about? Sorry, um, <laughs> <laughs> I had to send some photos off. Yeah, that's. Uh, that was, anyway, so yeah, I'm I'm here. Um, so yeah, so basically, it's been a been a whirlwind month. Um, I can't believe it's already we're already about one twelfth through the year. Um, I was in I was in Indiana. Uh, started the year in Indiana, visiting my uh, my old man. Um, it was really despite COVID, it was, it was really important to me that I, I spend the holiday with my uh, family. With, well, my, you know, not extended family because we, we canceled everything, but with my dad and my sister and her, my brother-in-law because uh, we lost my mom a year ago. And so, and I, you know, and if I wouldn't have gone back for the holiday last year, I would have missed that last, that la those last, you know, that last time with her. And so uh, I was in Indiana. I wasn't sure if I was gonna go uh, back, come back to Seattle, or, or try to catch uh, the you know the run up run offs in Georgia, uh, the or and or the the uh, what came has come to be known as the insurrection on the Capitol. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so just in case, I brought my little Leica Q, but not not any none of my other gear, and uh, and decided you know I looked at flights and flights to. Georgia to Atlanta and then to DC and back to Seattle were the same as to DC and back to Seattle. So I, well, okay, I'll go to Georgia too. I have a friend at Atlanta. Um, he let me use one of his extra Canon bodies. So I had a long, I had, I had a long lens for the Trump rally I went to in Dalton. Uh, photographed all the candidates there, even got, even got a Kellyanne Conway sighting. Um, at the Trump rally, I got hit by uh, Don Jr.'s wife. I got hit in the in the my camera lens got hit with a MAGA hat thrown thrown toward me, uh, and an old man who excitedly took it. Um, they get really excited about free free stuff thrown out, even though they're usually already wearing a MAGA hat. Um, so, and then I hopped over to D.C., where a friend I'd I've photo friends in just about every major city and all around the country. And so an, a friend let me use his Canon 5D Mark IV for a long lens. Unfortunately, while I still ended up taking at the insurrection, most of my photos with my Leica's fixed to 28 lens because the Canon Mark IV, he had it set so he focuses differently than I do. And I didn't want to mess up his settings. So I tried to get used to it and it wasn't working. And when I reset the camera, um, it wouldn't, it didn't have, there was no focus. There was not a button. I could not <laughs> identify a button and it was chaos. You know, it was anarchy down there. So I, I didn't have time to just kind of 
go through the menus and so I no focus so I had to manually focus all day for the first time in my life <laughs> and so and I was missing a fair amount of shots so I, I fared pretty well but handled it pretty well but near the end of the day he he, he called and and he figured it out for me and got it fixed but the day it was too late basically so most of the pictures are wide but I think for me that was the story it was the I, I've seen a lot of pictures you know in the media of kind of confrontation and you know uh riders uh riders pepper spraying the police and the police pepper spraying them back and just all this back and forth and for me the the whole scene i i'm glad i i i didn't get in the middle of that um it was plenty dangerous where i was but i i tended to stay back so i could so i could put all the all the frames in context by including the capitol dome in many of the photos the iconic capitol dome and so it, it puts it in context and so i and it was just the wider scene the chaos that really struck me because the last time i was at the inaugural stage was Donald Trump's inauguration, where it's just all, all uh, you know, very patriotic and formal, and a lot of etiquette and decorum, and uh, and this was the complete opposite. But uh, anyway, I'll let you guys ask, ask questions, and uh, I don't want to. I can talk, talk, talk. <laughs> so I kind of want to go in the direction you lead me. So uh, yeah, Nate, were any of the lenses and camera bodies that you borrowed part of that stash that they stole? Nope, nope, just my, what was stolen was my Leica Q, my MacBook, um, two SanDisk SSD cards, uh, uh, or not cards, but drives, which is where the, what the photos were on, and memory cards and batteries. And so I was, I was very light, um, but being light, it was all in my backpack, which I'm very, very uh, protective about, but I was just so exhausted, it got the better, best of me. I, you know, I, I walked away for, well, forgot to pick it up, grab it for three minutes and, and three minutes later it was gone. A professional thief, someone who does this for a living had taken it. Can you call that thief and ask him what the password is? I could, I could. Might be worth a try. <laughs> That's a good point. Yeah, I could say, hey, Sabrina, what's, what's, you mind me asking the password? <laughs> or, or you might have the DA ask him that question. Uh, <laughs> well, you should be able to uh, you should be able to start up your uh, MacBook um, and uh, mount it as a uh, uh, hard drive onto another Mac. Yeah, yeah. reboot uh, and oh. in targeted mode. I'm not the most. I'm just gonna. I'm gonna start with the Mac store. Okay, the Mac store. Apple store. I'm not Apple the most. store. Savvy, but thank you. Yeah, we can talk uh, later. But I do have a question. Um, what prompted you to get into the uh, covering uh, political things, uh, and what the hell did that have to do with weddings and and portraits? <laughs> Same oh. thing. <laughs> well, it's been a year's evolution. I um, I guess a little bit about me. Um, uh, I, I started photography exactly. I got a camera exactly ten years ago. Uh, before that, I was I had a little power shot that I when I moved to Seattle in two, the summer of two thousand nine. I like to, I like to uh, got upset, became obsessed with taking pictures of my friends and surroundings, and people noticed that I was obsessed and thought my pictures were good. and And I always knew I had an eye, I, but I didn't know anything about cameras, and so I I just assumed that having an eye was everyone had. I didn't think it was special. And so, but my parents, ever since I was like 10, had told me, Nate, you have a really good eye. And it just never clicked, you know, dawned on me that that was talent. And so, um, so I got my camera, I got it, I, I did a event, you know, essentially what, you know, was event photography for Seattle Gay News, documenting drag queens. And, and you know, I'm, the, I'm still the official pride parade photographer. And just the scene, 2012 was, uh, the, uh, marriage equality movement here in Washington State. So I heavily documented that and, and kind of got to know a lot of the politicos, local political uh, players. Um, then 2013 was all about photographing weddings and then and, and kind of finally owning more than one lens. 
because uh, I kind of got a little bit more, you know, I got at Seattle Gay News paid me 200 a week. Uh, and I would, in that 2012, I think I photographed 360 events um, that year. So now, you know, now I charge for event photography more than 200 an hour. Um, and so uh, just just hustling and, and kind of Seattle Gay News opened that door and I ran through and, and uh, gave me community, uh, gave me credibility, you know, all that. And, but, you know, I, it, my business started with weddings and I got a studio in the International District um, in 2015. Uh, since then, I've, I've, you know, it's nice being able to do portraits from not having to go to people, but have them come to me. So I've done more and more corporate headshots as I've, as I've learned how to use light. Uh, I'm still, still, I, I have a good eye for it organically, but I, but like John could, I could stand to learn a lot from John, for example. Um, my, and my strength and passion is still being documenting things. And so in the summer of 2015, I, uh, I, started getting on a jag. I, I photographed Bernie Sanders when he came to Seattle and uh, it was a long day. I photographed him at three different events, uh, August 8th or 9th, 2015. And uh, well, I, I blogged 30 of the photos and a, a editor from Time Magazine reached out to me, emailed, wanted to give me a call, uh, started a correspondence with them. And at the same time that gave me confidence to, I, I had been jealous of seeing the pictures come from, you know, peers coming out, out of the, new, the early, early uh, primary states of New Hampshire and Iowa. So I booked two trips, had just enough money, slept in my rental car, made do, whatever I, I you know, just made it work. Uh, I loved it. Here I am alone in Iowa, just time of my life, you know, going to Republican rallies. Uh, <laughs> happy as you know happy as a clam and a little weird but and so I uh, so I kept with it and I thought it, you know and I really hit it hard in 2016 I got the Bernie Sanders cover of time uh, and then from my byline being there other editors found me uh, through the byline but also through Instagram hashtags uh, worked for CNN Mother Jones Al Jazeera a few others and um I thought the end of the book would be the inauguration of our, our first woman president. Uh, and it turned out that was just the beginning of my book project. And so the book I'm this year, I'm solely working on that. I'm trying to limit the gigs I take, the commissions I, I, I you know, for clients I work, I, uh, I pick up because I'm really focused on putting this book out this year. Um, it's gonna be called Vote American, exclamation point. Uh, Protest pol political, oh wow! Uh, <laughs> uh, presidential politics and protest in the age of Trump. Um, right now, I'm down to forty-five thousand images. It's a good problem to have. Um, it's been really hard. It's gonna I be started, a big book. <laughs> I started last year with ninety thousand images. I'm down to forty-five, and it's enough for a lot of books. I mean, the attack on the Capitol could be its own book, frankly. And um, so I'm gonna be, I'm still figuring out the, I, I get a quote this month as far as, uh, and I have to, and I'm going to be determining the print run, the, the, you know, the number of pages and the dimensions. And so, and get different quotes for different sets of, yeah, sets of quotes. And so, yeah, anyway, that's, that's why, so I've just been hyper obsessed tunnel vision on, on uh, national politics uh, for a long time and, uh, and, not ready to switch gears, but ready to hold a book in my hands. Yeah. John Wallace is asking in the chat, a lot of your news photog photographs are black and white. Do you go into the events with that intention or does that happen afterwards? Yeah. And I, I missed the chat. Do you know how I bring that up? Uh, there should be a thing at the bottom of the oh, page. Okay, cool. Yeah. I wasn't even reading that. Yeah. So um, can you ask that one more time? Sorry. Yeah, a lot of your news photographs are black and white. Do you go into the events with that intention or does that happen afterwards? Yeah, so I, I shoot in color, black and white. I, <clears throat> early on when I was documenting Seattle's LGBTQ uh, scene, I did black and white uh, for my personal kind of stuff, not for clients, but for just because it was, it was color corrections take me a long time. And I was a amateur at editing and really, really rough around the edges. I, I did the full on, 
uh, artificial, you know, in post, I'd do the full on vignettes and, and I'd oversaturate things and I'd up the clarity to 100%. <laughs> and in color, the, it looks, yeah. but in black and white, that stuff tends to work. And so, and I found that it was a distinctive, you know, distinctively my, uh, plus I, I didn't know how to take pictures without on camera flash pointed straight on. Um, Cause you know, so I, it, it made for pictures that were innately mine. Uh, people could tell, you know, if you put a ton of pictures on a wall, which ones Nate took. Uh, and even though it was a bit obnoxious, but the black and white kind of uh, uh, looked refined, whereas the color looked really amateurish. And so uh, I've always been um, just kind of had a soft spot for it. But at the same time, 95% of this uh, political documentation I've done over the years, I photographed 300 events since 2015, uh, has been self-funded. And so, and color, like I said, it basically color corrections take me a while and with mixed lighting. And so it's a way to streamline my workflow, but at the same time, make the images uh, distinctive. So Paul Ben is saying that you've already put out a couple of books. Is that correct? Oh, I, I, my first year of photography for my, to thank my parents for my camera and my uncle Nat for helping me financially. I, uh, uh, with college, I, uh, I made a book of, of, you know, a small run of 20 books uh, of my first year, um, which is, I'm glad I have. That. I wish I would have done that every year of photography, frankly. And then I did this whole last year I spent, my soul, ex my existence was putting out a book for Seattle Public Schools. Uh, it's a hundred page, here, I'll, I'll grab it. It's a hundred page hardcover book. Um, we did a first run of 500. And then we did another run of 500 more, which is, I'm picking up copies of that second edition Friday. That's the edition I prefer because it has all the changes I wanted to make for the first, but because of time constraints. And, but it really kind of learned a lot about the whole process of working with a printer. Let's see if I can do this. <laughs> um, this is hard. <laughs> I know, everything's mirrored too. I know, this is so... So anyway, there's a there's two a, a principal and a, another. So it's it it honors the stories of, of students, staff, and their families um, uh, of Seattle Public Schools who are queer and trans. And so it's just really a landmark book. I don't believe anything like it's been done, uh, let alone the school district prioritizing it um, and you know budgeting for it. And so it was a whale of a gig. So I. Luckily, we finished the interviews. We, we had 44 participants with their families. Uh, and last year, a year ago, January, February, I cranked out all these photo shoots um, in two hour blocks. So one hour for, for the families and individual photo portraits, and then uh, another hour for the interviews. And so then Who did I- did the copy for the book? I did all the copy. I, I edited it I, and I ghost wrote it because basically we had all these interviews that were half an hour to hour long. I condensed uh, the narratives, you know, edited editing for concision clarity down to 300 to 600 words. Uh, so that was three months of my life, which was really hard. Um, but I, my background is as a journalism graduate and uh, wanting to be a writer. And, and after that, I worked in Mike Pence's hometown as a page designer, copy editor. So, so it took a skill set that I hadn't used in a long time, but I'm definitely consider myself a, a pro. And so I, but it, it's still, I prefer photography because it comes naturally, whereas kind of editing, writing, writing makes me want to copy writing makes me want to pull my hair out. Editing I, I, is, is fun. But, and then I did, then I spent the next uh, month or two designing it. And so I kind of start to finish. I, you know, I had a, I hired a designer to do the, t the initial templates. And then I put a lot of hours in making them my own. So real proud of that book. Um, you can, if anyone wants, I can post a link. Well, it actually has a sleeve on the cover, uh, but I hate sleeves. So jackets, if it were up, if it were, if I was the sole author, I did it in, in collaboration with the health director of the school, there would be no sleeve period, but. So but Rick, did that? Did that answer your question about self-editing the book? Is me on mute here? Yeah, somewhat. I mean, he, uh, Nate talked about ninety thousand photos, and then 
down to 45,000 photos. <laughs> I mean, are you doing that yourself? Obviously you have a great background in editing. I didn't realize that. So you are self editing. Do you get any, do you sound, do you get any help with that at all? Does anybody yeah, help? Yeah. Um, so my <laughs> goal has been to not waste people's time. I got a lot of people, good, great community of, of photographers and people who support me. And so I, my thinking has been that once I get it down to 20,000, Okay. Uh, and people are like, well, are you actually deleting them? And I'm like, yes, because I don't need that many. I mean, I'm just going to take more photos as I get older and accumulate, accumulate. And whether it's physical or digital, I mean, it's just all, you know, it's just overwhelming. And so I've been trying to, to really, you know, when I have several frames of something, just really narrow it down and, and just get rid of them forever. And so, um, forever? Goal, wait, forever? Forever. Yes. Uh, in the trash bin. Yeah, I've been trying to get them down to, because 20,000 photos is still way too many photos. And yeah. so, but my goal is to get it down to 15, 20,000, and then to sync up with people who can help me, uh, you know, just kind of have a brain trust where we can uh, uh, curate from there. Um, you know, and my book, I'm thinking it'll be, I'm thinking it'll be small format, uh, probably, the size of a small well I might do different several a set of several volumes where it's bigger and you can really you know a, you know bigger dimensions where you can really soak in the pictures but initially I'm thinking a book you can hold in your hands it's set you know so I can have a large page count and a ton of photos like a like a Tashin Tashin book mm -hmm. and so that's that's kind of where I'm leaning at the moment because just because of uh, uh, the economics of put you know yeah, just all page count. I want I want to include many photos I can because it makes my life easier. So hey, Steve, I'm curious. Yeah. The the Leica Q is not an inexpensive point and shoot. Um, are you also shooting with other Leicas? And what about your photography or your vision made you want to uh, shoot Leicas or a Leica? Yeah. So um, the Leica store Bellevue invited me to to do a presentation about parade photography because I've been the uh, my longest running gig is as the official photographer for Seattle Pride Parade which will be a book someday too probably for the fit in time for the 50th anniversary and so and the in exchange is thank you they let me rent a camera well I don't most like us are manual focus and I that's not my game and so I I asked and they said well the queue would probably work well it's real small and light and I shot used it at the parade and and fell in love the autofocus is is fast and accurate and it's it's sharp it's so sharp and so really <laughs> you know because i used to have a fuji uh 100s and oh my gosh is, and that was the focus was too slow and it, it, this thing's just so sharp the lens and so uh i I had a wedding in Croatia I photographed in summer of 2017 and I'd never been abroad before. So I wanted a travel little travel camera that wasn't my Canon DSLR. So I found one used uh, for $3,000. Knew they usually go for 4,000 plus tax. Used, it was 3,000, the sensor was dirty. So that probably cost me another four or 500. And Leicas have really bad, um, real, well, not bad, but really slow repair service. Um, usually if you send your camera and, and no one else will even try to fix it because it's a fixed lens camera, the local camera shops won't, won't take that on. So I, so sending to Leica, you know, if they, you send it to them, they're going to keep it for e a month easily. And, and they had mine for two months. And so later, once I sent it in, but, but you only see the dirty sensor when you're, you know, F10 and higher. Um, so, but basically, um, but which I do, I do a lot of F8, F10 stuff because I want as much of these scenes as much wide a depth of field as possible. Um, you know, I like artsy fartsy shallow depth of field as much as anyone, but it's all about the details. And so, um, uh, so anyway, yeah, I got a used one and I banged it up. Um, I would really love to source a Q2, uh, but they're on back order everywhere right now. Um, and the Q2 is basically all the improvements I would have want, all the things I would have wanted out of the Q initially, where it's weatherproof, it's it weather sealed, um, and it's faster because mine, mine does slow down quite a bit. If I'm taking a number of shots, it needs time to think. 
so that slows me down quite a bit. And then, um, which usually I'm not rallying off shots, but you know, when you're at attack on the Capitol tend to get a little, you know, trigger happy. Um, and then uh, uh, the Q2, oh, and megapixels. I'm addicted to, you know, my Canon is a 5DS SR. And, uh, you know, when I got it, I thought it would just be for special things, but you, it's addictive the amount of detail and, and then I tend to shoot wide anyway, so I can have flexibility in post cropping. And, and so sometimes I have pictures that because of the resolution have been saved because they were pictures within pictures. Some of my bet, you know, if not too many, but a few, a few really great ones that wouldn't, wouldn't be printable uh, if I wouldn't have had 50 megapixels. And so that's what I would like. That's why I'd like the Q2. Yeah. So How going many back to the- does it have? How many? Which one. The, the, the Leica. The Q is 24, but I think the pixels are bigger than Canon and Sony and stuff. So I would, I'd say it's a little bigger than that, but. Are they, C, are they CMOS or CCDs? CMOS. Oh, okay. CMOS. CMOS. So um, nobody uses CCDs anymore. Yeah. So Nate, I, Stephen Shore was asking, during the insurrection at the Capitol, there are a lot of people taking photos. How are officials differentiating between official press people and rioters with cameras or were they making any differentiation? Great, uh, it was a great question. So for one, I photographed, you know, not as many protests as my colleagues because I was working on the Seattle Public Schools book this summer. So I missed a lot of the protests here in Seattle and all the protests in Portland. But um, one thing about being at those protests is I was always afraid of the police. I've been threatened. I've been I've been targeted. I've been and my more so my colleagues have been. Uh, you know, I have a friend, good, very close friend, who's a 74 year old Vietnam vet who, mm -hmm. uh, at the protest in July 26th on Capitol Hill or 25th on Capitol Hill, he was he was shot four times by police. When you're shot that many with rubber bullets and when you're shot that many times, that's no accident. And he's just an old man with a camera, and so you know, and he had stitches in his leg which became infected. Ultimately, um, he had staples in his head and he actually carries a gun because he has a bad commute from Trailer Park and Everett. And the gun was in a fanny pack and it actually a blast fall shrapnel shattered the grip of the gun. Well, if he wouldn't have been wearing that, that would have been his hip. Mm. And so, so anyway, I, the police are the most dangerous when I'm on the street in Seattle. That's, that's, that's who I'm fearful of. <clears throat> and the difference was in DC, I've never seen the police so restrained. They had their kids gloves on, they were pleading with protesters to back off and let them do their job. And they were just pleading with them. And they, and never once did I, at one point later in the night when the door, when it was dark and they were running out in their riot gear with German shepherds, I was the closest in proximity to them. I didn't feel they were a threat to me at all. And, and so it was just, it was night and day as far as the police response. So in that respect, I wasn't afraid at the, at the attack on the Capitol, who I was afraid of were the, were, were the mob. Um, they are, they will, they are very easily triggered. They will look for any excuse to play the victim. And if they see me taking an unflattering photo, they will jump on it. It gives them an opening because, and I think it helped me because all my peers counterparts out there were, I was coming from Indiana with just my camera. So I didn't have any of my protective gear. I didn't have a gas mask. I didn't have, I didn't have uh, a helmet. I didn't have a flat jacket. I didn't have knee pads, um, didn't have goggles. All I had was an N95. And I'll tell you, I've never been happier to have that N and felt more smug to have that N95 because when there are just clouds of pepper spray coming at you, um, uh, I could breathe. It worked. It worked against the pepper spray hmm. and everyone else was just anti-mask to be anti-mask. So they're all coughing up a lung. And but, <laughs> so I'll say, so basically my point was since I wasn't covered, decked out in, in protective gear that, and a lot of the pe journalists had press written on their helmets and on their jackets, um, because I blended in a little better, I was wearing a maroon hoodie, which I wear everywhere. Uh, you know, I was, I, it was set apart because of my mask and my camera, but, but for the most, but I don't think they could be hundred percent sure that I wasn't one of them. And so some people actually treated me, uh, you know, when 
we were all pepper sprayed. It got, you know, people were helping me with, with the others, uh, you know, pouring water into my eyes. And, and, and they were, and when I was standing on a wall, a guy kept making sure I didn't fall. And people are helping me up and down. And so I had a fair amount of help, but at the same time, I had a fair amount of threats. And you just kind of, they're like, you just gotta just kind of, just not be careful not to look them in the eyes. And also when I was taking pictures, a lot of times I'll hold my camera up and you, most of the pictures I took, I wasn't looking in the direction I'm taking the picture. I'm just really <laughs> gotten really good over the years of holding my, of focusing when my camera's up here, I've just done it so much. Um, I'm pretty, pretty solid with it. And because if they see you taking the pictures, you know, the people you're taking pictures of, they will, they'll, they'll get mad. And so I had to act like I was searching for photos, looking over here, camera pointed over here. Mm -hmm. And so in other times we, we, uh, we were all pepper sprayed. So I had a beanie over my eyes and I'm just turning around in a circle, taking pictures with no eyes. <laughs> and so, and some of my best frames were shot like that. The ones published by Rolling Stone. Hmm. Well, Spiritone used to have this attachment that goes on the front of the lens with a 45 degree mirror in it. So you can point the camera one way and take a picture to the side. <laughs> yeah, a lot of the Roloflex twin lens reflex people used to turn their cameras 90 degrees. <laughs> yeah, it's real, uh, real, a lot of, yeah, a lot of danger. I mean, it was, but you know, I didn't plan there. I planned on going there as a, I knew it would be a stupid day. I knew it would be a spectacle. I had no idea. I don't think any of us did that it would be a hillbilly coup. I mean, it was just and a deadly, <laughs> you know. And um, people actually, thought, the FBI knew. <laughs> they well, had intelligence that it was going to happen, but the Capitol Police was not allowed to actually disseminate that information. Yeah. And basically, and the reason that that the Capitol Police were so nice to the MAGA crowd is they're white. The oh, yeah, MAGA crowd white. Um, this would have been a completely different scene where they're where they're more than you know. I'd I'd yes I'd hazard to say there were maybe one to two percent of the people there were of color. Uh, most were white men between the ages of uh, late twenties, uh, late you know to, to you know sixty and uh with beards and um and camo and and um you know and it kind of the day started with me i was running a little late because i wanted to be well rested after a few crazy days in georgia and and traveling and all that and so i i was walking from the capitol toward the washington monument uh toward the white house which is where president trump's speech was and I heard I heard the crowd that way, and I'm I'm walking along an empty mall, and I passed, um, and pa I came across a contingent of militiamen, oath keepers, three percenters, proud boys. It couldn't be clear who specifically. I met, I recognized some proud boys individually, but you couldn't I couldn't peg them as one or the other because, uh, like they said ahead of time, they were going incognito. And now we were, know they were going incognito, relatively incognito, because they didn't didn't want to be identified so easily, and and so uh, I had a choice to make: do I go to Trump's thing, or do I? I didn't see any other photographers in sight, and so I followed. I kind of just followed the herd of militiamen, and when I was threatened at that point, because at one point I I walked and made them walk around me. Well, that's that. Looking back, that was incredibly dangerous, you know, because they were prepping for war, and and so they were calling me Antifa and making fun of me, and I was, you know, a guy lunged at me, and that wasn't one of the outtakes, um, and so I was, I was kind of like, whoa, 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 I'm pressed, Rolling Stone, and they're like, yeah, I'm Rolling Stone, you know, and just, just, just teasing me and making fun of me, and and um, uh, calling me a bad guy, and and so, um, but yeah, you know, I think. There were enough of those people, but there were also a fair amount of people just got swept up in the moment. Um, there were no, there were elderly people who, in in the, you know, in, within danger on the front lines. Uh, there was only one kid I saw, and he was a teenager, and uh, and his photos included in the Rolling Stone gallery. Um, and so I made a point to take his picture because he got he had a face just just wanted to punch. I mean, he, <laughs> I hate that. You know, I know I'm not PC in saying that, but it's just gee, you know, a punchable <laughs> face. And so, um, 
so I made sure that I kind of was staking him out for a while trying to get the right right you know right moment and being patient with that but and a lot of time it was easy to be patient because you know you can't just go from one place to another when this is happening it's literally a mob and you are trapped and so you have to make do with where you're at that's why I never got up onto the portico where Biden was sworn in and it's also and I also we didn't have reception uh, recept cell reception was incredibly bad because of the mo it was a mob of cell phones and and uh, so I didn't know I didn't know they'd broken into the Capitol from the other side I didn't know there were another contingent of militiamen on the front of, at the front of the Capitol but I was on the what I considered the photogenic side anyway so I'm not sure even if I'd known I would have gone because I figured all the A-list photographers were on the other side and eventually got into the Capitol because they were coming from, they were all at Donald Trump's rally. And so they came with another contingent of people. Um, whereas I was with the Proud Boys all morning and they prayed, they broke for lunch. We got, spent about an hour at food trucks. I got some food too, uh, break time. And then they got in formation again and marched the peace monument where they met up with uh, the general populace uh, leaving the Trump rally. And that's when the, barricade they started kind of flooding over the barricades and I was in the front of the front at that point and I stopped I didn't know they were attacking and so mm -hmm. I, I didn't know what it was escalating to but I saw a layer of barricades breached and so I made sure to get photos of that and now I find myself in the middle of the front and so I wasn't in the you know direct line of danger uh where you know and those are the most rabid ones and so it's truly dangerous up there and so i think it was probably for the best you know i would have gotten nailed with bear bear mace and and all that and i think it probably helped my endurance for the day because it was a whole day whole day with without eating without drinking uh no i mean i had a hot dog um uh, but then you know no drinking because you're afraid you'll have to use the restroom and yeah, it just kind of a, so I, I think, you know, anyway. Worked yeah, out. Well, Rick was saying the person that was shot and killed there was a woman. Were there a lot of women in the crowd? Uh, there were a fair amount of women. Yeah, just families. These are just families. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, many, and so there were a lot of women. Um, and when the woman was shot, I was on this, on the press riser, directly looking, even with uh, where Biden was ultimately sworn in. And they started, I wish I would have, I'm, obsessed on my st getting stills but looking back i haven't seen this in the media uh, i haven't seen this footage and i i wish i would have done a little video here and there because at one point after they found out she had passed they uh they started chanting i they started holding their hands up and chanting i can't breathe uh which yeah take you know yeah and then uh and you know at the same and also with the bad reception they were they were all convinced that this was big tech silencing them. I mean, these people are so far gone. I heard conspiracy theories I wasn't even familiar with, and I've been around <laughs> these people a few times, and and they're they're just rabid. They're so their their reality is just so they are so far far gone. And all around me, people were saying it was the best day of their life. And uh, you know their president had told them to do this. This they 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 saw that they were the good they were fighting the good fight, and it was really really tragic. Um, so going back minute, to the edit. Oh, go ahead, Ian. Okay, from one minute to the next, as you're looking out over a scene, what makes you decide to push the shutter button or not? Well, <clears throat> I'm really judicious, careful about when I when I, uh, how many pictures I take, because I'm really slow on the back end, I would make an awful wire photographer because speed is not my strength. And I like to put my stamp on my edits instead of gently saturated images that blend in with everyone else's. I like to kind of their art to me. Whereas I think for other photographers, they're more technicians and, and they are brilliant at what they do, but, but uh, I just, I'm different in that. Um, so I'm, and other people are so fast at, you know, they, they're using their motor drive. Well, I was almost upset that the Mark IV that I borrowed was much faster than my 5DS. And so whenever I'd hold the shutter down, I'm used to it, click, 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 click. It was a, <laughs> and it was too many photos. It's like, <laughs> shoot, shoot, I'm taking way too many. So I had to uh, change to one shot, you know, because I'm, I'm more, 
I, I, I will never need a motor drive. I don't need 15 pictures in a second. Um, I'm, yeah, and so I don't know, I've gotten good at, over the year anticipating, I don't know, just what a, I think will be a good frame. Um, I took way too many and it was because of that 5D Mark IV, I took 2,800 or three, I took, no, I deleted some earlier. I, I took 3,000 photos that day. Uh, I can guarantee just about every other photographer probably took a lot more. Um, so, so Jeff is asking how you process the images. Are you doing Lightroom or something else for all your yeah, black and white? Yep, I've, I've used Lightroom every day of my life for the last 10 years. And so um, that's my jam. And I'm, I'm, I know people are switching to Capture One and stuff, and, but I'm, I'm Lightroom all the way and it's getting better. And you know, gradually getting faster. And so I'm just really, really slick at Lightroom. So you, and then you, can, if thank, I wanna, you can thank, you can thank me for that. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so, um, because yeah, it's gotten a lot faster, better at handling the 50 megapixel photos than it used to be. Um, uh, still not as fast as I'd like, but, but it's just, it's my workflow and, um, you know, and if I need to do some extra, uh, extra things with opening up shadows or, you know, uh, I, I'll even dodge and burn in Lightroom. If I need to go a little extra, I'll take it, I'll bring it, make it a tip or PSD, bring it into Photoshop, open up the shadows a little more, then bring it back into Lightroom and give it another layer of sharpening uh, or clarity. Uh, yeah, which I can't, I can only do so much with the raw files, but once I have a new file, I can, I can give it a little more. Uh, yeah. Sharpness. So going back to the editing thing again, uh, Paul Bannon saying, I don't mean to be an alarmist, but the photo of Bill Clinton hugging Monica on the stage in front of a huge crowd was one of those that may have been tossed away because she was an unknown, but the photographer did keep it and realized later what he had. I mean, <clears throat> yeah, do you no, worry no. about that? No, I don't. I, uh, <laughs> I do that. I already, um, I already keep a wide berth of photos. Uh, like, you know, the, what, you know, the difference between 40,000, 20,000 or 90,000 and 40,000 are a lot of duplicates, a lot of duplicates, just kind of mm -hmm. different sequences, you know, and, and a lot of just blah. And so when there's politicians faces, I'm not familiar with, uh, I can't say spectators so much, but when there's people who might be known who I just don't know yet. I, I, I'm always, I always err on the side of caution and keeping those images. Mm -hmm. If there's any kind of like, if Bill Clinton was hugging, if I got Trump hugging someone, I'm going to keep, I'm going to keep a couple frames of that. Cause he, well, for one, he doesn't hug people. <laughs> uh, the dude's a germaphobe and I've never seen him barely touch anyone. I don't know if he's even, yeah, I don't, I, I don't know. I don't know. Oh, if I've wait a minute. So, I, I, I hate to throw a wrench into this, but the first part of your statement doesn't doesn't sync up with the next statement that I'm going to make based on Stormy Daniels. What are you saying? What about he Storm? doesn't hug people? Oh well, now that is <laughs> he went a little further than hugging people with <laughs> oh, Stormy. Well porn, well, porn stars maybe. <laughs> yeah, I've never seen him hug anyone including you know, his wife. I photographed him about 30 times over the years and <laughs> never seen him touch anyone for that matter. I feel sorry for the flag that he hugged. He did hug a flag, yeah. <laughs> and just this week, you were talking about looking for network uh, attached storage like Drobo or Synology and the like. And how's that going? Yeah, so last time we talked, I uh, I had my, my hard portable hard drive from I, I, I went to five Trump rallies in six days uh, leading up to election day. Um, and then, then the day after the morning after the election, my hard drive failed. Uh, I was able to find a really awesome recovery person in the Seattle area. His, his business is Dave's Data Recovery. <laughs> Highly recommend, very reasonable. Um, he could have charged me a lot more and other people would have, but he, he his original diagnoses and quote, he stuck to that. I think he felt a little pity for me. And I think he also thought it was cool. He was helping out a Rolling Stone, uh, someone shooting for Rolling Stone. I think that went my, you know, helped me out. But, um, but anyway, if you ever need data recovery, go to him. He's fantastic. He's out of uh, Issaquah area. <clears throat> um, and 
Well, anyway, that happened. And then I, this is my follow-up trip to that was to the Capitol. And well, here I get my stuff stolen. And so I've, you know, I don't think people are going to be as sympathetic the next time, next go around um, um, because my community really came through for me to help me replace my gear. And then, you know, I, I'd actually already sourced a, a use like a cube because I'm really dependent on that camera for how I do it's inconspicuous and just how I, how I shoot at these things. And so really, really dependent on it. And so I, I sourced one for 2000, which was a great deal much better condition than my my one that I got back the next day, which I didn't know I was going to get back. It, it looked, prospects looked, uh, uh, didn't look good. And um, so, oh, so anyway, so here I failed hard drive and I get my stuff stolen because I had it all in one bag and that backed up. And so I've, I'm making a lot of changes to my, my routines. Um, now when I travel, I'm going to, you know, I have stuff on one SSD. I have stuff on a, backed up to another SSD maybe even another, and I'll have one in one bag, one in another bag, and or on my person, or, and even, even hard, even my cards, I, I'll just, I bought more cards, and so I won't be wiping the cards and reusing the cards right away, um, and um, so anyway, this has all led me with the money donated to me from my community, people really came through for me in a big way, and then I got my stuff back, and so I, I let everyone, I try to be really transparent, and what I'm, you know, that, well, I'm better off than I was before. And so uh, I think it's important. I let everyone know I'm going to invest in data management storage, which I haven't been able to prioritize or afford for many years. And it's due. And I got an army of hard drives that aren't routinely backed up. And I've just been, you know, living, flying by the seat of my pants for a long time. And so I said that I told everyone I would I would invest in that um, and also give money back to people who would like it. But I think a lot of people wanted to show their support and are, are proud of happy to, and also give credit on pre-orders for my book, though, which I haven't figured out the price of yet. And so this week, two days ago, I ordered, it arrives today, a Synology 1621 or something. It's a six bay. Uh, I got 16, or I got six 16 terabyte hard drives that are pretty fast, 7,200 RPM. Um, and, and a friend who knows his stuff recommended. Um, and uh, that arrives today, I'm gonna set that up. Um, I'm new to, I'm not great at technology, but it's my first NAS system. And then if it goes well, I'm gonna double down and get one offsite. Um, and while also, uh, uh, figuring out how to get the stuff on the cloud eventually, or, or at least the important stuff on the cloud as far as like deliverables for clients and stuff. And, but, cause it's a lot, 40 terabytes is a lot to put on the cloud. Well, you so, might look yeah. at, at Backblaze. They're pretty, yes. pretty reasonably priced. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. While so, we're talking here, I'm going to share some of your photos from Facebook, if that's okay here. Facebook? Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, just You so can also go to the Rolling Stone, uh, the Rolling Stone features. Okay. I'll do that these in a are all out, These are all outtakes, mm -hmm. and they're low mm -hmm. res because they're Facebook. But Nate, if you don't mind me asking, how, how old are you? I'm 36. And John, it looks like, uh, oh, never mind. Yeah, I, I'm 36. You look 25. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, this past year has been good to me. I've... Uh, uh, I think I lost weight due to, to my depression diet and, uh, and uh, I'm, the, I'm the fittest and I started yoga. And so uh, uh, I, I'm the fittest I've been in 12 years. So, and the lightest. So I lost 20 pounds in the last two years. So thank you. So here's the Rolling Stone coming up here and people keep, keep talking, keep, keep asking questions to Nate. There we go. And people ask me if that was my finger. <laughs> it is not my finger. <laughs> you no, actually, it, it's too clean. You <laughs> called him by name, Stephen Fender. How did you find out his name? I asked him. Oh. <laughs> he was, he was uh, helping hold me up, making sure I didn't fall. He thought I was another uh, fellow patriot. Well, you are probably a patriot. Just not in the way he, uh, yeah. yeah. I really love this. This picture is them. That last one was them scaling the wall. There's a five foot wall that they, that they, they what they're climbing it with is they repurposed the barricades as ladders. 
And there were also even step ladders. People were, this was heavily planned. There were step ladders. People were, were crowd surfing through the crowd uh, to the front. There was, in this picture right here, there's a flag. They're crowd surfing to the front uh, and uh, so they could hang them. And they, they, and this guy was reeling from pepper spray. Um, that, anyway, that's one of my favorite images, I think, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Here they're removing a barricade to use it as a ladder. That was one of the frontline barricades. See, and you can tell in all these, there's a sense of place. In all these, I'm making sure that that dome is in the picture. And I really think in a composite, here's the kid I wanted to punch. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> he had a flag that, that read, uh, release the Kraken. Who's the guy that's it? And you can see I'm using wide depth of field always. The focus here is on the scaffolding. There was at one point, there was a Canadian flag being waved, which was confusing to me. I don't know if they were advocating moving to Canada or what the deal was. <laughs> the guy with the, fur, the, the horns that was all over the media uh, inside the Capitol. I got pictures of him, but they weren't in my edit for Rolling Stone, so I haven't released those yet. Um, I got I got pictures of him. I'm really mad at myself because I actually encountered him in Phoenix, Arizona in the run-up to Election Day at, when I was at, leaving the rally, and I was just too over it to take a minute to get a good picture of him. And so I, I could have had pictures of him prior. The kid whose face I wanted to punch I'm pretty confident I, I, I photographed him before at a Trump rally. And it's not, it's not, um, it's pretty normal to see people, these diehards from one rally to the next uh, across state lines and everything. Hey, Nate, can I ask you a question? Yeah. yeah. So one moment. And so this picture, there were, this was, I didn't go get that close, be, well, because they were in a cloud of pepper spray but also it was just so crowded, but also the most dangerous people were close. And so I was trying to, anyway, so I used a zoom there and got the focus with the manual actually. <laughs> Good, Melissa. Okay, yep. I just had a question for you. So my husband was watching the news and during this whole nonsense. I, I just want to pull my hair out. So I didn't want to watch, but um, he said that there was somebody holding a Georgia flag but what they did not realize, it wasn't the state of Georgia, it was the Republic of Georgia. Did you see that guy? Yeah, that I think that's called the, um, oh, what, what was it? Oh, the, the, the Bonnie flag, I think. Or maybe, I don't know. I know at the uh, a few days before inauguration in Richmond, Virginia, I ran into, a, well, no, in, inauguration day, I got some pictures of a guy wearing a Confederate flag because they took away his flagpole. And eventually he put it away and was, what what the flag look like? Uh, oh, I, I wasn't paying attention, uh, but my husband said it was the Republic of Georgia, as in Russia. Russia. Because the yeah. flag that the flag that I saw leading up the inauguration was a blue flag with a star, and it's called the Bonnie flag, and it was one of the original Confederacy flags, but also the Republic of Texas and the Republic of West Florida, evidently. Uh, but it's little known. So um, no, I didn't. I you know a lot of the state flags. There were a lot of Arizona flags, which I think were three for Oath Keepers. Uh, militiamen um but i uh oh this is uh it's leading into yeah this was my counterpart during the inauguration was ed cashy a celebrated war photographer and so they hired him because i think they wanted his perspective his eye on uh, the militarization of washington dc because he's been in actual war zones and you know abroad and so i, I think that's why they hired him as well for a different perspective than me that was cool to you know it's like oh wow you hired a <laughs> I heard a guy who's been to a hundred countries and, and very well known and yeah, me. <laughs> cool, there are other questions for Nate. Anything yeah, John, else people can want you to bring, bring, up? bring up the uh, in, the inauguration photos? Uh, on From Facebook? Uh, oh, you did a few, those were just outtakes, the ones you did. They're, yeah, they're, but, here, I'll, I'll send a yeah, link. You, you can share if you want. Okay, I'm not, I'm just not so good at, or send me the link. If you just put the link in I'll the chat. I'll send you the link. I'm not good at multitasking. <laughs> if anyone's curious uh, about my, you know, you probably heard everything here, but I did an interview with uh, King Five, uh, with Mimi Jung, and then I did an interview with uh, 
uh, Malcontent News. Um, <laughs> oh, that one. And then I did another one with uh, Yuko Kadama of uh, Bellevue College's radio station, which is uh, 91.3 KBCS, and those are all online. So. Uh, let me start the share again. Hold on. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for doing that. Sure. And I'd like to hear your take on what you thought these people were going ultimately going to do if they had succeeded in everything that they wanted to do. <laughs> yeah. Scary, huh? I, I, uh, you know, I, I don't, uh, uh, I think they did what they wanted to do. I'm just glad, uh, you know, that no one set off any bombs or, or, uh, or more people died. Did you know? Yeah, um, a lot of people were injured and and hurt and killed and uh, you know. And I think they did what they wanted to do, though. Um, what, what 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 did they do? Well, you tell me. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. They broke into the storm, the Capitol, and and made their point. And and for a lot of them, they thought it was the start of a. You know, they were saying her all around me. This is just the start. The start of the revolution. And so, uh, um, it caught me off guard. I thought they were just going to yell and scream. I didn't know it was going to be. You know, it's a, such a bizarre thing that I didn't get it and captured in an individual picture. But the fact that they were, you know, they're waving Blue Lives Matter American flags with a blue stripe in the middle. And meanwhile, they're yelling at the police like, we don't want to do that. We don't want to hurt you. We don't want to do this to you. And in the meantime, they're like, you know, there were moments of just kind of like, hey, we're on your side, pleading with police where the, while the police are pleading with them. And if these would have been BLM, you know, anti-police brutality, you know, demonstrators or, or people of color, it would have been a much different story. I mean, there, I didn't see, I didn't witness any blast balls. I didn't, so many things that, were absent from this. Um, the police were taking great care to, yeah, be, anyway. Hey, what, uh, what uh, do you think you would like to go shoot next? Or how do you decide, uh, assuming it's not an assignment, how do you decide to go find something to shoot? <clears throat> well, um, it helps with, I mean, actually during COVID, it's, it, you know, I'm, we're trying not to travel, but it, frankly, it's a, it's very easy to fly. It's cheap. You can buy flights the day before for super cheap. And uh, that, that's what made this all possible. I wouldn't have been able to travel like this uh, or travel leading up to the election to five different states in six days. I actually went to six states, but when I landed, one of the rallies got canceled because of high winds. And so I would have been six rallies six days and that just wouldn't have been possible in the before times. And, um, uh, so I, I just kind of monitor and, and uh, keep my eye on things and, uh, and it's, e it's just easy. You know, on the planes that I you know, try to fly, uh, Delta and Alaska are super empty. I feel safer there than, on a, than at the grocery store. Yeah. Um, it just really, you know, you get your whole row and some. I mean, all the rows in front of me and behind me are empty. And so it's just really, yeah, you know, I guess I'm not in the demographic most at risk, but I feel pretty comfortable flying at this point and uh, I get tested. I'm very good about getting tested and isolating when I get back. And, uh, but just kind of keep your, you know, eye on things. And, and uh, uh, you know, my recent moves, I've, I've gotten a, uh, a few of my photos from the insurrection will be published in the next issue of Mother Jones. Um, and they've helped me out with a reference uh, for my application uh, to be, uh, an accredited member of the uh, U.S. Uh, Press Photographers Senate Gallery, uh, because when I was there uh, in D.C., it, I would have I would have appreciated being able to photograph the uh, introduction of the impeachment article, article of impeachment, or and or uh, Pete Buttigieg's uh, confirmation hearing. Um, but as it stands, because of COVID safety precautions, they're not giving out day passes. To any member of the media, and and it takes a month to be accredited, to, you know, to get membership, to even photograph inside the Capitol. So all those pictures of the soldiers sleeping inside the Capitol, I couldn't have photographed that if I wanted to. 
And so that's my next step is something that I've been meaning to do for years. And so Rolling Stone and Mother Jones are both writing me letters of reference. Um, so I can, so if, so if something comes up, I can jet over there and be there. So uh, Nate, I, I do have a couple of questions. One, it, well, first of all, there's proof that you can shoot in color. Um, <laughs> I'm just saying, I mean, it doesn't have to be black and white. No. Uh, but there's one shot of the National Guard guy with his um, uh, in tight, you just see his eyes at the top. He's holding his gun and a package of tomato ketchup. Yes, I saw that. The first one. I Is did. there any idea why he was holding on to ketchup? I don't know. I don't know. I, I, you know, to be honest, I didn't notice that till I had the, the, the ketchup. I didn't, I was zoomed in so much and my lent, my glasses were fogging up from my mask. And so to be honest, I didn't notice that till I got it on the computer. Yeah. And, well, one, of, one of the well, things I would, I would say been, is I would have asked him. Oh, fake okay. blood. Fake well, blood. <laughs> yeah. One of the things I was going to say is that 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 is a good reason to carefully inspect everything before you toss it. Yep. <laughs> because just, little things like that you might not catch. Nope. I, and don't worry. I've, I've, yep, pretty discerning. Uh, and then the other thing I was going to ask, because this is also color, and I, I enjoy the uh, contrast of your black and white reportage versus uh, what you're doing with the American superhero. You haven't talked about that at all. And I find those very interesting from the standpoint is such a diametrically opposed visual, uh, but you're seeing, you know, you're seeing that I, I like the uh, kind of the amber background instead of white. So it's 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 really important to me that I don't get pigeonholed as just doing one thing or the other, and to constantly innovate my style and uh, grow and evolve. And so um, the superhero project was a way to show people that look, I'm good at capturing moments, isolating subjects, and capturing moments and lighting even though it's pretty straightforward, high key, but that I can do that. And I can do it well because clients need to see that. They need to see exactly what they want photographed oftentimes. They can't, they can't just see, a lot of times they can't see the art of the, art of the work. They have to see, if they want a corporate board meeting photograph, they need to see examples of that. That's what I've learned over the years. And so it's just a way to, you know, and I'll tell you the black and white work, people may appreciate it, but it hasn't gotten me many clients. Hmm. You know, it's, it doesn't, it's oftentimes harsh and unflattering. And so it hasn't won me, it hasn't made me any money. And so, um, so I like to show different, you know, that I can do the other stuff. And so the superhero project, it's on hold right now because of COVID, but in short, we're dressing up, uh, you know, high profile change makers alongside local activists and, and just friends and, and, and they share their stories about, about being American, you know, their, their thoughts on, uh, well, their, their strengths, their vulnerabilities, or, you know, or you could say, you know, superpowers or vulnerabilities, their defining moments in their lives, what it means to them to be American. Um, we ask questions like that. And, it, and it, you know, and the words, and I still have a lot of the words to edit, and, and a, lot, a fair amount of pictures I haven't shared yet, um, but the stories are more compelling than the photos. At first we thought it would be about the photos and it's really about these stories. And that's actually what the uh, Seattle Public Schools, they saw this project and reached out to me and, and wanted to team up with me for the, uh, 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 our Students Their Stories book that I put, up, put out, you know, centering uh, queer and trans students and staff. And so that, that got me that whale of a gig. And so this is on hold. Uh, there's still a lot more to share, um, but I'm I'm really focused on getting the political documentation book of political documentation out there this year. And and there, you know, I figure this is kind of a timeless thing that we can come back to the superhero project uh, hopefully next year. Uh, well, I've gotten eight eight Congress people, seven of whom are women, uh, participating. Got a list of people who are ready to like. This is Veronica Escobar right here a first Latina Congresswoman of Texas. Um, and I got three fourths of the squad. Uh, my, you know, just don't, so I've, I've always been telling people once that's Rashida Tlaib, uh, 
and once I get uh, AOC, I, I might just call the project done. Uh, <laughs> that's been my goal to get the AOC. I'd also like to photograph Colin Kaepernick. Cause, well, for one, his nickname is Cap, like Captain America, but I would like to get him kneeling with uh, kneeling with a with the you know Captain America shield. I think that would be quite a striking image. And Michael, and it's one thing to do it as a comic book illustration, one thing to get him to really do it. And that's what I have my heart set on. And I also like to get people like, uh, you know, like Gloria Steinem and, you know, just, yeah, just a diverse array of people. How about some of our indigenous uh, 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 citizens? Absolutely. We got a guy in California I've connected with who has, he, he, he's into, uh, he's into, uh, uh, ah what do you call it when you dress up in costumes at the comic cons and stuff um i'm i'm blanking right now but basically he's cosplay. made cosplay, cosplay. Yeah, that's he's made a cosplay he's made a captain america outfit inspired by indigenous you know uh style and so he's he said he would love to participate uh this all started with uh my friend and collaborator vishvajit singh who's uh, out of new york city and he goes by his performance art this name is sick captain america and he uh and he's been well he project wouldn't have happened without him and he inspired it and he's been uh with us every step of the way and and so he did the trips to dc with me and we've become really close in the process and so i look forward to uh, us continuing our adventure um, so is is your superhero set up um uh, uh kind of light enough that you can pack it and carry it yeah, so it was my first time ever traveling with gear. I got one of those, uh, got a knockoff, uh, what do you call the really hard boxes um, that everyone has for camera oh, gear? Pelican. Huh? Pelican. So I got a knockoff Pelican from um, a cheap, it was like 50 bucks uh, from, uh, from Home Depot. Uh, unfortunately, it didn't, the first trip, it, 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 it yeah, it didn't. It I, showed I, it. <laughs> I really liked it, and but it, I already had a chip in it, and so yeah. I uh, I exchanged it and bought a Pelican. Um, and uh, yeah, I travel light. Basically, when we took it on the road, we used uh, I borrowed speed lights from a bunch of knockoff speed lights, Godox speed lights mm -hmm. from a friend, and then uh, had adapters and and just umbrellas, um, mostly uh, uh, just kind of real. Um, oftentimes, we had very little space. We shot in the congresswoman's offices. And so Pramila Jayapal was actually, her and her team are actually honorary members of the team because they went out of their way to support us and to, to help us, let us store things and help show us around. And she actually texted Rashida Tlaib to let her know that, you know, I know you wanted to do this, but your, her team wasn't being the most receptive and Pramila sent her a text and, and they had us scheduled the next morning. And mm. so she really came through. She was also the first high profile person to participate in the project, which gave us a lot of leverage. Um, and- uh, How about uh, Biden? What's that? How about Biden? <clears throat> um, yeah, I'm really disappointed because of COVID restrictions, um, precautions. Um, they, I never once, I was doing the superhero project last year and then COVID happened and he wasn't doing events anyways. I have not photographed one campaign Biden campaign event, nor have I ever photographed Kamala. And that's a big gaping hole in my narrative in my book. I and to so try it now. I might, I might, but you know, I'd like to think inauguration day was the conclusion of this book. And that would be another book. The one time I worked with, I have photographed Biden at the DNC. And also um, I got to work with him my first time ever setting up um, uh, lighting on location was uh, I was hired by Senator Cantwell's team to do the step and repeat, which is where all the rich, wealthy individuals get to pose with the VIPs for photos. And so that was my first time ever in 2014, fall of 2014 ever. I wasn't very, I was very new to light. I rented a set of lights, Ellen Chrome stuff. I don't know. And I, um, <laughs> and I, uh, I got to work with Biden and so it was, my second time wearing a suit, first time wearing a suit was two and a half years into being a photographer. I was invited to be the uh, uh, the photographer for one of President Obama's visits. Um, due to my connections and someone following my work from the marriage equality movement, they appreciated my work. They didn't. I didn't even know them. They recommended me to the DNC 
one night I got an email Friday night. This is fall of 2013. I got an email. Uh, I was, I was, I was drunk. I was a little, you know, after a night at the clubs at the bear bar, taking photos of, of you know, burly guys having fun. Um, I uh, got home and they said, well, we've been referred to you. The guy who referred to you, his word is gold. If you'd like to be our guy photographing the president in one week, uh, give me a call. And so uh, one week later, I'm in a room with two dozen people who paid $16,000 to be there and then the president of the United States, the leader of the free world. And so, you know, and, and he, you know, he, he's so photogenic. He's actually was really hard to photograph. It was during the 2013 government shutdown. He looked super tired. He looked super bored. And it didn't help that most of the people in the room asked the worst questions. They're like, what would you like your legacy to be? And it's like, I'm thinking, he knows you like him. Ask him about Guantanamo or drone strikes or stuff that, you know, we might be, you know, not so sure of or, or fans of. And, um, but at the end, he perked up, he lit up once I took a photo of him and the catering staff. And then I asked him, sir, you know, I wasn't going to get to ask him for a photo, but people like, Nate, you need to ask him for a photo. So I sir, can I get a photo with you? And, and he lit up even more uh, ear to ear. I got a picture of him ear to ear grin where he's, uh, uh, he's he points and he says, first, I'm going to make you look good. And so he walks behind me and fixes my jacket suit collar, which was ruffled from my uh, camera strap. Uh, that was Obama. Then Biden, um, <clears throat> at one point, they asked me to step aside. So his official photographer, a government employee, that's why they hire me. And uh, they're, they're not, the, their official photographers aren't supposed to photograph fundraisers and stuff. And so uh, to keep that distinction, but he was getting a picture with like the uh, Jim McDermott, Congressman Jim McDermott and the, and the Tacoma mayor at the time. And so he was getting a specific frame. They asked me to step aside. And that's when I got my best frame actually, which would have been a throwaway for anyone else. I wish I had it ready here. Uh, it's a picture of, I, I stood in place uh, with very, it was low light in the room, very slow shutter, high ISO with my 5D Mark II and, or no, Mark III, and, um, and just kind of stood as still as I could, rattling off pictures, hoping to catch the other photographer's flash. Well, I got a picture where the shutter curtain, you know, here down, it's black. <laughs> here up, it's super bright. Well, it's in perfect focus. And when I got it in post, a lot of people would have thrown it away. When I got in post, it was my best photo of the year. And it, and I, it was exactly what I was going for. And so, but basically once that time was up, they're calling me, they're signaling for me to come back. And, and I thought they were offering me a chance to get in the frame to pose with the vice president while the other <laughs> was working. So I run toward the vice president, shake his hand, and I'm happy as, a, as can be. And it dawns on me that, oh no, they want me back on the job. <laughs> and so I, and so I, I halfway through the shake, I'm like, oh my, it, you probably saw it wash over my face. And so I, I run over to my position and all the rich people in the, in the room are like, oh, and so I was resigned to the fact I was not going to get a photo with him because at the end of those kind of things, his aides are buzzing around and they, they get him out of there. Well, he, he looks around, he's like, where is he? Where is he? And he points, I need a photo with that guy. <laughs> and so, and I, he walked up to me and I'm like, well, actually, can we, can we stand under my lights? And he's like, whatever you want, son. And patted me on the back. And he was just a class act to work. You know, he went out of his way. And cool. I just really a pleasure working with, with the vice, well, at the time yeah. he was vice president. Going back to the journalist stuff, Scott was asking earlier, are you aware of the subjects looking directly at your camera when you photograph them? So I'm going to share the screen again with another set of photos here while sure. we're talking um, about that. You know, I actually, <clears throat> um, I actually, some photos I actually um, will take a little long, especially people I'm not politic socio politically aligned with, especially old white dudes who support Trump. Uh, I like to take a little longer to take the pictures, and and that's when you really get the glares the glares come out. And so you really get a little something more, a little more when you went, a little more engagement. Um, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Uh, it's my way of kind of having so, you, so Nate, you'll admit that you're not entirely politically neutral. That, that, you know, um, 
I, I like to think when you have me photograph anything, I think I, besides that, I feel a little more sensitive to, you know, people I'm more aligned with as far as uh, uh, getting away with stuff uh, like that. But that's the one instance. I like to think I photograph, I take the same approach all the time and kind of just see what I see. Um, but that is a, uh, that is, I guess that's an exception that I do do that. I guess I'll, I'll, I'll give them a, I'll stand in front of them a little extra because they, you know, they're so hostile toward photos. You just kind of stand there like what you're going to do, you know? And well, sometimes they'll show you what they're going to do. So, yeah. So now I, I, yeah, I guess there's probably some inherent bias, but I like to think, and I'm very open about my views on social media. Um, and, uh, I think we, I think we all should be, I think, I think, uh, um, I was not saying that was a, I was not saying that was a bad thing. I was, no, no, I know. It's I, actually a good thing because if you are completely neutral, um, you're giving the other side too much respect. Yeah. That's how I feel. I feel, uh, I feel you got one, you know, protesters this year. Uh, who I'm a little more sensitive about, you know, um, especially when they don't want their photo taken, because for the most part, there's plenty of people who are, are, are okay with their photo taken. And so and no need to photograph someone who doesn't want their photo taken at those things. And, and so unless there's a real action moment, if it's just a portrait, I'll go ask some, I'll go to someone else. And a lot of times I'm not asking, it's just there's some psychology behind taking pictures. I've done it enough that when people don't want their picture taken, they let you know it. They will let you know one way or the other. And so usually it's a head nod or something or eye contact or I'll put my camera up and if you know you'll psych it's a lot of psychology. Um, I forgot what I was saying. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, oh, but so basically those were those were people fighting for civil rights, whereas this Trump mob was uh, people who are fueled by you know it's all all predicated uh, upon lies. And from a man who is morally bankrupt, has no redeeming qualities, not one. <laughs> and I think it's important to be outspoken about that. I think it's important for, to not acknowledge that as okay, and, and, and this is here and this is there. No, one is like, whoa. But and tell us how you really feel. <laughs> yeah, but the, but, but, the, but the issue with that is, look at all those senators. All those senators, all those Who's Republican senators, insurrection. Hmm. Yeah. Well, uh, basically, they were afraid of Trump. <laughs> well, they're no, they're not afraid of him. They're afraid of his supporters. He doesn't um, have he doesn't have social media anymore. It's the supporters. Six of one, half dozen of the other. Because because if, if if Trump decides to tell his his supporters, uh, uh, Joe Blow won't you know won't support me. How's he going to do that? <laughs> oh, he'll. Uh, you mean because he's not on social media anymore? Yeah. Um, and the regular media bar barely covers him anymore. Yeah, because he's yeah. tweeting. But he's got, well, he's got his a, lemmings. He's got his no lemmings more, that, that are out there doing their stuff. Matt Gates and Holly and, and mm. yeah, these two people are positioning Bannon. themselves. Bannon. Yeah. Hey, Bannon. <laughs> hey, let me ask, what do you see yourself doing, let's say, 10 years from now? Um. <clears throat> these days i haven't even i can barely know what i'm gonna do the next day um so this year i'm focused on a book next year i want to do uh i want to get back to the superhero project and continue finish that i had a i've had uh i've connected and met with a smithsonian curator twice who's very interested in acquiring the work um and uh just Figuring that that's a whole that'll be a whole new process because she thinks there's real potential for a traveling exhibition, uh, which I would have to organize myself. So basically, um, and then uh, I want to do a book uh, uh, about my last. You know, in a few years will be the 50th anniversary of Seattle Pride Parade. So I want to do my book. You know, of the la it'll have been the last 13, 14 years documenting that. And then I want to. It just I'm very book oriented. And so then I want to, uh, you know, the other ideas for projects I've been sitting on for years, uh, I just haven't had the means or, or it hasn't been prioritized. I want to do a project where I follow the uh, Imperial Court, Imperial Sovereign Court, which is the oldest uh, LGBTQ nonprofit in the world. 
Um, it's a network of uh, different, there's, there's uh, these uh, coronations and there's groups and every, you know, in all these cities throughout the North America, including Mexico and Canada. And I would like, and it's, and it, they're aging out. There are a lot of LGBTQ nonprofits now and it's, it's the oldest and their membership's getting older and older. And so you got these 70 year old drag queens, you know, wearing their finest <laughs> stuff from 1980. And so I, and no one's documenting it. Like, like I'll be the only camera in the room at these things and it just blows my mind. And so I would like to spend a year. I have a lot of contacts in the organization. I'd like to spend a year just going from, from, you know, uh, uh, coronation to coronation, which are these big ballroom, very formal ceremonies. And I'd like to do that for a year, you know, because we're losing them. People are passing away and they're getting up there and, and so I was fortunate to, to photograph the founder uh, my, first, my first two months as a photographer. And then uh, before he passed, he was 86. He died when he was 88 or 89, I think. And then, um, and then I'd also like, I have in the back of my head, I'd like to do a project where I, an excuse to travel the country over the years, I've connected with a lot of people with the last name Gowdy on Facebook. And, uh, and <laughs> most of them are Southern Baptist or black. And so we come from very sep different backgrounds. And so I would, but there's that connection. Uh, we, we all go by the same identity. And so I would like to um, visit these people and do portraits and kind of tell their stories and, and all united under our name, my name, which is, you know, not very common. Um, and so I guess I'm just to have all these projects. I guess to answer your question, I have, a, I would like to be. I would like to be working on this stuff full time and, and instead of uh, having to uh, take on client work to get by, I've been, I live on very little. I live in Seattle and I, every year I live on uh, 15 to 20,000 a year. That's how much I pay out to myself. And you so like I would, you seem like you would be in, in a good position to potentially uh, take on a rep um, has something like that. Which would, which would, Maybe, maybe I haven't felt like I'm there yet because they, well, they take a portion of your pay. And so I haven't felt that I haven't been in position to really utilize it the best, but it's something definitely uh, I've to look more into. Um, uh, but I'd have to be confident that it would actually, yeah. So, but I would, I would love to do political photojournalism full time. Um, it's sad to me that the state of the industry is my Rolling Stone hired me to document CHOP, the occupied zone outside the abandoned police precinct in Seattle this summer. Well, and at the beginning of July, that was my first time I was commissioned, put on assignment to do this kind of work since 2017. Like mm -hmm. it boggles my mind that I can't get hired to do this. And a lot of it's I'm in Seattle and I'm away from all the, the where all the editors are, are, they're all stationed in New York and DC and stuff in Atlanta and, and I'm I'm on the other side of the country so that so a lot of times they don't want to fly photographers out to things so I'm always paying for my own travel and everything so do you, do you, do you sell any of your any of your work yeah yeah I, I think that's an avenue I can do I can probably make a lot of passive income I got a whole backlog of people wanting to requesting wanting to order prints um, I think once I you know do you have a website? Not where I, not where they're for sale. No, I just, you, I can only do so much. I mean, I, you know, and people are like, well, get an intern and that's a lot of work. I've had five college interns and three high school interns. And usually I put as much work into it as I get out of it. And it's more work than it's worth. I really love help and bring up new talent and, and the camaraderie, but it's, you got, you know, just kind of getting your feet under me is a constant struggle, especially when you're on uh, limited income, very limited income. Um, well, at least you look like a million bucks. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I'm still, and so now I'm, I'm, I'm just excited because uh, I've been on, on unemployment much of the year. I was able to get retroactive unemployment. And so I'm, that's kind of stabilized me for the first time ever. I have, I'm, I'm doing better than I've, I'm in a better position position today than I've ever been. And so that's why I'm able to focus on this book. Um, I'm going to bring up another photo here that Jeff is talking about. Whoops, did that? Huh, huh. That's yeah. one of them. I mean, you know, serendipity, 
there's a question, would you rather be good or would you rather be lucky? Of course, I'd rather be both. But being positioned and being able to get a shot like this is just really remarkable. Yes. <laughs> well, it's just a spot on a uh, close to empty riser because it was it was his he was he, well he'd been speaking for an hour and everyone else had filed their photos or were tired of him and i saw this angle and i was really uh worried i wouldn't be the only one because everyone else were working for local newspapers or the wire agencies and they were sending their photos out meanwhile i i was working for the stranger and so i i and well they oh, i was just going to do it for me and they they ended up publishing photos so i wasn't really work guaranteed this would be published anywhere and so i was just worried worried someone else would see it because it was so kind of cut and dry it's like so easy um i got a similar image on the website with mike pence with what looks yeah, like the next one john dunn's cap or a uh, kkk <laughs> yeah. oh. i mean <clears throat> Same deal there. That was at CPAC, and I was I wasn't working for anyone. Mother Jones helped me with credentials. The editors uh, been really kind over the years, and I really we've never met in person. But so really, CPAC let Mother Jones uh, press come in. They did. The only time I've ever been denied credentials was um, was the NRA on behalf of Mother Jones. So, and I think it was because it was on behalf of Mother Jones, but I didn't have many many other i don't have very many contacts in the industry so i don't have, i didn't have any better connect you know it was either mother jones or seattle gay news <laughs> which is gonna which has better odds you know i don't know and so i thought mother jones was at least prestigious and um but the pence picture i was i was right behind uh attendees head for that angle right next to the press box um where we're not supposed to stray too far from they keep you penned in pretty well and i was right kind of yeah just kind of I was afraid this I would touch them because I was so close to get that frame I shot about 50 frames um, because if his head isn't just so it doesn't work and I tried the same thing with Donald Trump with the M behind him a time there was the word time and getting like devil ears <laughs> and you know it just didn't quite work you know I got the frame and but Pence had to have his position his head position just so for that to work out of 50 frames that's the only one that works and so um, but I was so nervous because there were a lot of A-list photogra well-known photographers. I was so afraid someone else would naturally see what I was doing. And luckily no one did. You know, just kind of having fun with it. I think, uh, yeah. Well, I think that's a non-traditional approach to be able to, because uh, most people are probably looking for expression or something <laughs> else as opposed to uh, dealing with uh, backgrounds and, and things like that. So congratulations on getting those and actually seeing them yeah. Yeah. and working towards it. Mm -hmm. And I, well, yeah, I, I, I feel like a lot of photographers I know, <clears throat> I haven't seen a lot of other photographers work in the studio, but I think it's especially important in the studio. I see, I'll see photographers stumble onto something really good. They'll, they'll, they'll be, it'll be so close, but it won't quite be there. And instead, they'll they'll they don't I don't know if they don't have the confidence or what, but they'll move on to the next thing instead of really honing it in and nailing it. And that's why what took me so long to get into the studio was I'm a perfectionist with crazy severe OCD. I'm I'm double the dose of Prozac than anyone you've ever met for my OCD. And so um, the the event photography and photojournalism is a way to I can't I can't I can't I can't abide I can't um uh humor the ocd it's like i can moment happens it's done you're done you missed it or you didn't you know you either got it or you didn't but in the studio you can refine 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 i can refine forever and so many people <laughs> don't and i but i bring that to the events now i've over the years i used to run around like a chicken with its head cut off but now i'm really good at anticipating and identifying keying in on something and i'll kind of i'll be very very patient and just and, and that's an advantage of not being on assignment um, oftentimes and just doing my own thing because a lot of times people feel the pressure to get this photo, that photo, that photo, that photo. Well, I can go to an event and be like, no, I'm just, I'm, this is going to be the one photo I get. I'm going to think really it's because you think it's because of uh, you're getting older? More experienced. I mean, um, yeah, you just got to be, you can't just walk into these environments and take nice photos. I mean, you can. You definitely can, but you can't. It's going to be harder because I'm I'm able to anticipate 
and just have the experience of so many events where I kind of know what I'm going to get out of different environments. And so you have to, you have to really, because otherwise you're going to get a lot of average photos and photos that look like other people's. And the goal is always to make an image that you haven't seen before. Um, okay. I think a lot of people, Nate, don't see what you see either. Um, and that's why they didn't get that photo. I was going to ask you in the situations like the insurrection event, do you get quite scared during that or does your energy and excitement for documenting the story just keep you going and it doesn't matter that you're scared? No, I'm a, I'm a, <clears throat> I was not nearly as close as other photojournalists. When I arrived at the, when I'm getting past the first line of barricades and there was the five foot wall that people were climbing, scaling, right when I arrived at that point, there was a viral video of a press photographer who wore a GoPro and he got, he was at the very front of the action and he got, he got, he got beaten and shoved and ultimately the way where my our stories collide was I first thing I see when I'm getting to that wall is he, him being thrown over the wall mm -hmm. and he has that on video you can google it I, he was an AP photographer John something and he was thrown over the wall and at the same time I'm trying to capture that but I don't want to be caught up in it I'm trying to keep my distance because I'm afraid they're going to turn on me and so that set the tone very quickly um, if, if, I mean, it already been set when I marched with the proud boys and they were threatening me and I had a guy lunge at me and, and on the, and I got a picture on the Rolling Stone website when I was photographing the barricades, the first glare going down, a guy is pointing at me. Well, he put, he, right after that frame, he shoved me off, off a three foot balustrade at the base of some stairs and I'm a good faller. <laughs> and so I take pride and I, I've fallen off my bike a lot and I, I, I always end up pretty okay. And so um, I have confidence in that respect that I think the adrenaline, it's just happening and, and it's, it's exciting and it's addictive and it's, um, and, but I've been, that was the most surreal thing, but I have actually probably been scared or when the, you know, it's a lot more frightening when uh, the police are part of the violence um, because they have actual, these people didn't have that I knew of. I saw a few uh, uh, brass knuckles and stuff and they were certainly equipped, but nothing like, uh, you know, they're not, these people aren't, you know, no rubber Militia. bullets and no uh, glass balls and no, I don't know. It's it just the police, it takes it to a whole nother level when they escalate. And so I, I, pro I don't know. I, it's, I'm, you know, and I'm still, it's been a few weeks and I'm still processing. Um, I kind of like, whoa, maybe I should have been a lot more afraid than I was, but we didn't know people, we didn't know the extent of it. You just see this, this, this anarchy. Happening. I mean, the rest of us watching on TV knew more than you did in there. You knew a lot more than I did. And people, I started getting texts once my reception worked so much saying people like the Rolling Stone editor was like, are you inside? Did you get inside? I'm like, and that was the first news to me that, oh my gosh, they're inside. And, and I kind of regret not going inside, but I'm, I'm happy. You, know, you can't be everywhere. And I just got to be at peace with that, you know, because yeah. And anyway, it's just kind of, you know, and I had an eye on it that I feel like I have pictures mine. I feel like I haven't seen that angle as much. I've seen all these pictures from inside or from the front, but I haven't seen the pictures of the inauguration stage in the same way that I took them. So, and that so, was by being a ways back. Was there a noticeable change in the crowd when they decided to, um, you know, complain about Pence? Because when I was watching it live, all of a sudden it was this hang Pence business. Uh, and I don't know how that happened. What, because I don't know what the timing was. You were there. Was it something that Trump said? I, you know, I wasn't privy to the specific threats to Pence. Again, I, I wasn't following the news. I was just seeing what was in front of me. And I had seen a lot of animosity toward him throughout the day, but nothing like what you were seeing and hearing about. Um, actually, the most afraid I was all day was I, the press riser. There's a riser directly parallel with Bi where Biden's swearing in, directly parallel. And it involves climbing a long, long ladder. 
And that was the scaredest I was all day climbing this ladder uh, because just so much instability and, and just craziness that there was no help if something happens. And so it was, so I was, I don't know, I was just kind of, your hands are numb, you're tired, you're not at your, you know, your wits end and climbing this really, really tall, probably the tallest ladder I've ever climbed. That was the most danger I felt like I put myself in. Well, this has been really informative and a lot of fun too. Uh, let's see, Jim just posted, Trump had previously said bad things about Pence from not trying to illegally weed out the electoral college people. Wait, what happened? Yeah, I, I think um, Jim was just echoing what others were saying there. Okay. Trump had, had been tweeting about uh, Pence. Uh, Trump, Trump wanted Pence to uh, deny the Electoral College uh, representatives from Georgia and, and other states that voted for Biden. And trying and, and uh, The certification of the, uh, the Electoral College. Yeah. Thank you. That and so the crowd was already previously disposed to being anti Pence for a couple of days before that, um, and there'd been chatter on Parlor and other places about Pence. Pence is a traitor, and Pence has betrayed us, and Pence has betrayed Trump. Um, so that added Pence to the list of people we need to punish for being bad. Mm. Yeah, it serves him right, huh? <laughs> you know, the only thing I've heard about Pence. For lap dog all the way till the end and, and oh look what happened you know but the only thing i've heard about pence since is that he's homeless <laughs> i actually i actually uh moved to seattle from uh i lived in bloomington indiana and i worked at the newspaper called the republic in mike pence's hometown of columbus and when he was a congressman that was back in 2007 to 2009 and so i've been familiar with him for a long time he was on the front page all the time the publisher was best he was best man at the publisher's wedding very con mm. most concerned, you know, if you've ever seen the inside of a newsroom, usually there are just stacks of shit all over. And this was, it was pristine. Like it was, I mean, you wore a suit and tie to, to the office, a very conservative, uh, not necessarily a conservative newsroom, you know, as far as views, but conservative environment. And so uh, that was one of the reasons he's, Pence is one of the reasons I'm in Seattle. Because <laughs> I had to put him in the newspaper every day. And it was like, oh, I got to get out. <laughs> cool. Well, I want to thank you all for joining us today. As I said, this has been a lot of fun. Uh, great to thank you for coming back again, Nate. I know you're just here in November, but so much has happened since then. Yeah, thanks, John. I, yeah, I look forward to when we when we when we can uh, have a beer. Yeah, one of these <laughs> days. We'll, yeah, we'll hey, you know, I'll tell you the hardest part has been the come down. You, uh, the whirlwind of a month, and after the after the attack and then my stuff getting stolen and then recovered and everyone helping me and just all that. And then all the interviews that ensued uh, for days, it felt like I was just, I, I, you know, I don't drink a lot of caffeine and I just felt wired adrenaline for days. And I'll tell you once all that's passed and the, the inauguration itself was super slow. Uh, you actually, it, things, nothing was given to you. You had to really, search there were more for every demonstrator there was 20 cameras um so to make unique pictures it was a much more of a challenge uh it was the opposite and uh you know i didn't wish for trouble but i wished for a little more spectacle uh i think i came out i did okay with what i had but it was it was really hard and then coming home from after all this ups and downs has been really the hardest part because it's like well now i'm in my office with my pigeons outside the window and uh, and I have to kind of return to all the things I've put off all month. Um, <laughs> it's kind of hard. So yeah. thanks for letting me do this because it's a little, little <laughs> socialization because it's incredibly isolating being out on an adventure and then <laughs> coming back. Very cool. Well, thank, thank you. you. Thanks, everyone. I'm going to stop the Facebook share. Thank you. And... This was great. Thanks. <laughs>